All right, now I'll turn it over to you, Dustin. Cool. We're live. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, this month's edition um, of uh, the Kids and Creativity uh, Gaming Affinity Group uh, meeting. We're excited to be with you this month, and this month we're talking about game jams. Uh, so there are a bunch of people on the on the hangout today that have been involved in planning game jams or leading game jams or at least they know what game jamming is uh, and they can uh, help us all understand that a little bit better. Um, so just as a little bit of background, um, uh, I, my name is Dustin, I work for the Sprout Fund and we help steward the Kids and Creativity Network here in the Pittsburgh region. Uh, we've been doing this work for a number of years and now count uh, well over a thousand people as part of the network and everyone is together thinking about ways to remake learning um, and gaming and interactive technologies are a big piece of that. Um, and so my two sort of co-hosts here today, uh, Nikki from Zulama and Todd from Elizabeth Forward School District um, have been helping to lead this affinity group. Um, this is actually our twelfth uh, hangout that we've done um, about all sorts of different topics, things like design thinking, project-based learning, blended learning, deeper learning, etc. Um, and you can view all of those um, episodes in the, in the archives on the Zulama YouTube channel. Uh, so today, like I said, we're going to talk about game jams. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, the rest of the panel here to introduce themselves momentarily. But if you'd like to leave comments or questions throughout the way, uh, I believe that questions are enabled on the Hangout, so you can leave them there. Um, or underneath the YouTube uh, video in the in the comments area. So with that, let's uh, kick it over, and maybe Nikki, you can go next. Yeah, sure. I'll go first. Um, I'm Nikki Nafta. I'm the CEO of Zulama. We worked with a team of the faculty members at Carnegie Mellon University to develop a program that teaches middle and high schoolers how to design and program and create art for video games and other interactives. And I'm really interested in finding out how more of Zulama's students can participate in game jams and potentially how Zulama can help host game jams. That's why I'm here today. Gary, you good, next. Good afternoon. I'm Todd Karushkin. I'm the assistant superintendent, Elizabeth. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Your video just, um, di just disappeared for a minute, but you're back on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, again, my name is Todd Cruz, and I'm the assistant superintendent of Elizabeth Ford School District. Um, we started our Entertainment Technology Academy at our high school using Zulama back in January of 2012. And um, uh, we've, we've tried some different game jams and, and different things in, in our school, and, and can't wait to share them today. How about you, Gary? Oh, sure. Uh, I'm Gary Gardner. I do a lot of things. Uh, I work at Idea Foundry where I help uh, entertainment technology companies get off the ground. I also have my own uh, entertainment technology company and ed tech company called Dream Flight Adventures, and I'm a both independent or professional game developer. I participated in the Global Game Jam uh, at the end of January of this year with my family. I made my first video game when I was seven, and so I took my seven-year-old son with the Game Jam with me this year, um, so that's, that's how, why I've been invited today. Great, and Susan? Well, I'm trying to figure out why Bev invited me here. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm Dr. Susan Manning, and I do teach a course on using games for learning, um, but my students are the teachers, uh, and we really have not yet gotten into game jams because they're really focused much more on the simple kinds of board games and modifications to games you already know, not so much digital or video games. Um, so Bev invited me to be here, and I think just to listen, but I'm really not sure. Well, I can pipe in on that a little bit. Um, I know that get, we're not talking about game jams only having to be digital game jams. So first of all, the idea of creating paper games and other kinds of games definitely falls into the category of what we might want to be interested in doing from a game jam standpoint. And then I think she also knows that you're interested in um, just the general idea about how games can motivate and how you know that when you're working on a project 
like a game design project, um, you know, you've had experience sort of shepherding people through the motivational aspects of completing projects like that. So, oh, which is very much aligned, you know, to what we do in game jams. So, I'll just I think that's part of my two cents on that one. Okay. And then Eileen, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Eileen Owens, Director of Technology and Innovation from South Fayette School District. We're building a computational thinking strand K through 12, and I'm here today to talk about our version of Game Jam, where we took on partner schools, and we all came together to actually do a uh, team building exercise and to work between the virtual and physical worlds using Game Jam, and uh, we are very excited about the. Uh, opportunities it presented for our children to meet others and kind of bond during this experience. So um, we're really thrilled with the results. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's good to have you here today. And we've already used the word or the, the phrase game jam about a dozen times. Uh, but before we go further, perhaps we should try to identify what that means. So who would like to take a stab at explaining uh, what a game jam is? Let's not all jump at once. <laughs> I'm willing to start just because I am take a stab willing to... Oh, okay. All right. Go for it, Gary. Okay. So a game jam is basically a short period of time. It can range from anywhere for a few hours to a couple of days or so where people get together and make games. Um, the, the game jam I was involved with is a global game jam. It's about video games, but they can really be about anything. Um, they're often collaborative experiences that promote uh, taking risks, trying new things, pushing yourselves to new limits, um, maybe interacting with new people. Oftentimes people show up at a game jam without having a team in place and they'll meet people, work together for a very intense period of time to make a game, and and sort of walk away from it having learned a lot of lessons in a short period of time. Yeah. And what about game jams in schools? Like, Eileen, maybe you could explain game jams and how, because you've done it in the school context, right? Right. Uh, for us, game jam is problem solving, it's collaboration, it's team building. And um, an example of our game jam is that we had uh, two partner schools uh, with the Grable Foundation, uh, through support from the Grable Foundation, and we were building computational thinking into their districts. And so uh, each group, each building worked independently using Scratch. Some, some One school site made video games, another school site uh, was using it to make quizzes, and then another used it in a different way. And then it was our chance to bring them all together to actually um, take them a step further where they're actually beginning to move into engineering and design using the physical world and then showing how the physical world interacts with the virtual world through motors and sensors. So it was kind of a, a chance to bring everyone together to do that problem solving together for the first time, kind of level the playing field, but each one had their expertise that they could um, kind of donate or uh, provide for the group. And Todd, you did more or less, you guys have hosted game, a Game Jam sort of event in the summer, is that right? Or no? Am I mistaken? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, during okay. our summer enrichment program, um, we did, uh, for kids actually from grades four through eight, um, they had three hours to create a game. And it was more uh, physical game, board games that they've created. Um, even uh, this past year, this past summer, we did uh, some things with our high school uh, gaming kids where they created board games, um, but again, not really digital at that point. Uh, last, last year, during the Digital uh, Learning Day, we had a big event in our, um, in our media center where we had stations and kids were uh, designing, um, <clears throat> they had about six hours or so, but they designed digital games, uh, physical games, you know, board games, um, and it was also another way for us to highlight all the work our kids are doing in our um, Entertainment Technology Academy, our Gaming Academy at our high school. So um, other kids were able to see what 3D modeling looked like, um, what does you know Python and Game Maker look like, and um, so and it, it, got, it got more kids engaged in our gaming curriculum. So um, it was really a school-wide thing we did last year um, that really promoted 
again, our gaming academy, but also um, let kids be creative on making digital games and, and physical games also. Awesome. And Eileen, do you, I don't know, um, whenever you want me to share your pictures, I can. I'm not sure, maybe, I mean, Gar I've heard Gary's Game Jam story. It seems really interesting. Maybe we should start off with that. Gary, do you want to describe your Sure, experience? I can dive in. Okay. Yeah, so, um, I mean, as I mentioned when I introduced myself, I made my first video game with my dad when I was seven years old. It was called Gary's Adventure, and it was still really cool. It was a, a very simple point-and-click little thing. I just put together some clip art and some sound effects. You clicked on one thing of art, it would take you to the next screen, and I made this elaborate little uh, adventure game. And that was really the first time I got interested into game development, and it stuck with me for my entire life, and it's led to all sorts of wonderful things. So I uh, really wanted to kind of pay it forward and give my own kids that chance. Um, there's a lot more opportunity for kids to get involved in, in game making than, uh, um, than there was when I was a kid, but even so, my kid uh, hadn't really done a whole lot. He loves, loves playing games, but I figured, hey look, it's the uh, the Global Game Jam, which is an annual event that uh, attracts professional game developers and game development students from around the world. So it's a, it's a big annual industry event, and I said, hey, what better way to get my kid uh, involved with game making? So that's what I did. I signed this both up, and we showed up at the uh, Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon University. This was back in January. Um, so the way the, the global game jam works is uh, sometimes teams show up together, sometimes individuals show up and form teams. No one knows what the, the secret theme is. The whole idea is you, you, come up with, you come with a blank slate, you have no preconceived notions, you show up, form teams, and then they unveil the theme, and then you have 48 hours from a Friday night to a Sunday night to finish your game. Um, it involves a whole lot of overnight uh, fever, you know, as you work through the night. Uh, so I didn't really know exactly what it would be like going in with my kid. In fact, I have a... How old is he? Uh, some photos I can start to share. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, and he's people. young, right? He's seven. He's, yeah. He just turned seven. Less. There we go. Yeah, he's, he's really young. So, so here we are. If this uh, picture's coming through, we're sitting at the ETC, yes, hanging out, waiting for it to start. And he sort of... Uh, he couldn't wait. He he dived right in and started drawing some pictures. Um, turned out he was a little bit sick, and so we didn't hang around much longer than the, the opening ceremonies when they unveiled the theme. We went back and uh, started working from home, which was actually uh, a really unforeseen blessing because we got his little brother involved and uh, also my wife, and so we made it a, a whole family activity. Um, I stayed up a few hours that night, and then we all sort of went to bed, and we picked it up early Saturday morning and worked throughout the day. But um, you know, what I really wanted going into it was to create some sort of experience that my kids could play together, because they're they're iPad zombies, they love video games, and I wanted to let them play their own creation. So that was one of my goals for. Aside from that, I wanted to let them sort of steer it, uh, and. You know, I pride myself on being a pretty creative person, but honestly, I would never have been able to make this game if it weren't for my kids. Um, we asked them what they wanted to do, and it was actually my second son, Peter, who's five, who came up with this uh, great idea. He says, you know, um, oh, for a little bit of background, when uh, my wife and I tell our kid bedtime stories, we always start off, once upon a time, there were three little boys, a big boy, a medium boy. <laughs> and then the story kind of takes off from there. Uh -huh. So, so we wanted to to kind of take this bedtime story adventure with with our three boys and translate that to a game. And so I I kind of posed that to uh, my kids and uh, Peter, who's the medium boy, he came up and the, the little boy lets all the ch chickens out of the chicken coop. And the other two boys don't want their brother to get in trouble, so they have to go catch them. <laughs> and so my oldest boy got really excited by that. He says, yeah, and they have to go to a volcano, and they have to go to a rainforest and, and fight um, a giant gorilla, and they have to go to a desert and to fight a snake. So he came up with all the bosses and the levels just off the top of his head, just like that. So w with that little conversation, the game was born. 
Uh, and so over the course of the weekend, let me see if I can flip through some of these. Um, there we go. What we did is we just busted out our markers and our paints, and we let our kids have at it. They were doing the artwork. They drew pictures. We told them we need a volcano. We need a medium boy. We need a big boy. Uh, so they would draw it. We'd use our uh, our camera just to snap a quick picture of it, and then I'd pull it into the software. I was doing the programming. Um, my wife did the, the sound effects. Well, she did the music. The kids actually recorded the soundtrack. They did really <laughs> cute voiceovers, and we captured them saying everything. That's and great. Into the game. Uh, this picture here is uh, this is a gorilla monster at the end of the rainforest that you have to uh, face after you get through the rainforest. Uh, these are if they're coming through. These are the the characters for the big boy, mm -hmm. the medium boy, and the little boy. Uh, so it was it was a great fun experience. The the kids got um, really involved and. Um, they were really excited at the end to be able to see that these professional game developers, um, you know, on the end, at Sunday night when we're coming together for the the big event at the end, these professional game developers who do this full time for a living or or are in school programs, uh, they were loving the kids' game. They were playing it and they were getting really into it. And at the end of the day, we actually won the Google Prize for technical ex excellence, uh, which was Great. absolutely amazing. Really fun experience for the kids and and. The, and even now, they love playing it. Um, my, my littlest kid is always asking to play the chicken game. It's a two-player game. You have to work, uh, uh, you know, the big boy and the medium boy have to work together to go capture those chickens. So it's a, a fun collaborative game. And it's going to be on the, I, uh, the iPad store soon. That's great. That's awesome. What a great story. It's terrific. So... Susan asked a question about how many kids participated. I mean, Gary, do you have a sense of how many people participated in the Global Game Jam that you were part of? Uh, well, there showed were up three game? kids, mine. Well, I know yours, but I mean, like, how big? And were then there were, there were, right, right. The, um, there were about 125 participants. Most of them were uh, grad school age or young professional age, you know, uh, mid-20s to mid-30s or so. Did, was the participation limited, do you think? Did you think they capped it, or were they, was it just completely open? Is that just how many people showed up? Yeah, yeah, it did. Uh, the Global Game Jam is, is very hot. Uh, it, it fills up quick. This is, I think, their 12th year doing it, and they, they sell... So uh, really quick. It's basically tied to the venue, how many people then you can realistically support. So this it was, was at and you, and after okay. about 125, they had to cap it off. Okay. Yeah. How about Todd and Eileen? Did you guys have a specific um, cap in mind when you were planning your game jams? It, at our school, we were looking at no more than 100 students. So uh, with our media center and different stations within our media center, we were looking at, at, at 100 students. Um, Gary, let me ask you a real question about the, the Global Jam um, at the ETC. Wasn't there um, sessions before the big weekend that if you wanted to learn a little bit of Unity or learn a little bit of 3D art, you could do that before? It, it was like building up to the event? Right, yeah. So a 48-hour game jam is really not the best place to encounter a tool for the very first time, right? Because there's just not enough time to... Uh, to uh, do that. So what they did is provided several workshops and sessions leading up to it, the, like a crash course in Unity or a crash course in, I think they had Unreal, or just different toolkits um, were made available uh, to help you get sort of up to speed before the clock starts ticking. You know, and I, I think, Nikki, you think about um, a public school and, and, you know, kids go to uh, eight period, nine period days, and they... they um, you know, they, they go home, they come back, eight period, nine period day again. And, you know, how do you build these into a school where you have some type of culminating event? So after, um, you know, after a semester that we can get kids together or, you know, if, if they're right. learning different workshops or different courses, so. Eileen, did you do anything leading up to your game jam? Was, it, was there any kind of that... Progression, or was it simply an event in one day? Um, well, it was part of, um, as part of the Grable grant, uh, our job was to help build computational thinking in partner schools. So uh, we picked uh, like fifth grade 
at um, Manchester Academic Charter School. We worked with their whole fifth grade classroom, which is, you know, one class. And then we worked with Fort Cherry. We did um, in-class options, but we also did an after-school program with their uh, fifth and sixth graders. Mm -hmm. So they were the selected audience. And then in our school, uh, we embedded K through five, well, K through eight now. And so we chose the after-school scratch team. Uh, so each uh, three represented their school and okay. um, represented the activities that they learned. So should we show some of the pictures from your game, Dan? Do you want to talk us through those? Sure, that'd be great. I don't want the time to go by without us seeing those. Let me oh, see okay. if I can pull them up for you. Well, I had them up here a minute ago. There we go. If, um, if oh, I think I might have it on the second page. Do you want to start on? There we go. We start um, in the beginning. Here we go. Uh, these yeah, are all schools. <laughs> these are all three schools represented. We also have um, a team of fifth graders from South Fayette who were also incorporated to Game Jam because we, um, when we roll out new projects, we pull out leadership teams so they can help in the classrooms. So among each of these uh, groups, there's also the new group that will help implement when we um, start it within the curriculum. So a lot of these things are pilots, and then we'll start our game jam within the curriculum also. If you move to the next slide, yep. um, it'll show you the um, activity itself. Um, we designed Rube Goldberg machines that interact with the physical and virtual worlds. Students use recyclable materials, and their task was to create um, an engineering kind of machine that would take a marble um, to from one machine to the next. So the marble passed through the physical maze they, cr they created, and then it hit a, a sensor, a motion sensor in Scratch that started the Scratch program. So then something happened in the screen on Scratch, some fun activity. And then at the end of the program, it, um, sh it started a motor um, that started the mobile, the um, marble rolling to the next team. So in the next slide, you can see that teams had to collaborate and work together. So um, we started off with design specialists. Design specialists um, formulate a design that will connect the two machines from each adjoining team. We had 10 teams. Each team was paired with a partner. And so they had the difficult task of figuring out, you know, like, how high do you start? to get the marble to run through and to the next uh, maze. And then on the next slide, you can see um, that we were divided into uh, uh, each team had certain specialists. They had the material engineers. And these material engineers uh, were the ones responsible for running to the recyclable bins, pulling out the equipment they need, and figuring out how to engineer it. And you can see in the picture the design that they made and that they're trying to build from their uh, drawing. And then on the next slide, you can see that um, we have another. Uh, we have other specialists. Um, we have uh, we have captains who actually have to negotiate between the teams with the communication specialists to make sure everything works together. And here you can see that we're uh, really um, implementing computational thinking concepts. So when they when the computer programmers, they're another uh, part of the team, they're responsible for building the Scratch program. And through that, we're reinforcing sequence, conditional statements, parallelism, loops, those kind of computational thinking concepts. When you move to the next slide, you can see that we're also um, building, uh, I want to say, uh, habits of mind. So the students through Game Jam, they learn to be persistent. They learn to be creative and imaginative. They learn to problem solve um, as they build this virtual, physical world engineering uh, machine. And um, as we go through, you might see a few more pictures. Uh, you can see that uh, they're very intent on um, the problem solving aspect. And you have to think it's pretty complicated when these children have never met before. 
um, not only have they never met, they're put on teams with people they don't know, and then they have to actually come up with a solution in a very short amount of time. So um, it was so uh, exciting. It was exciting to see them work together, and actually uh, they were um, thrilled with um, the results. Um, you can see again, like I, I don't um, have a close-up of that uh, picture, but I, uh, I, you can see a little bit more about them as they're moving through Game Jam, all the design thinking that had to take place. And um, what we really found out is at the end when we interviewed students, one of the favorite um, remarks one of the students made was she said, the most um, exciting thing about Game Jam is no one told them what to do. There was no teacher saying, okay, take these steps, lay it out this way. It was yeah. totally their idea. And they were so excited that the creation had to come from them and their minds. And, uh, and it was a, a unique opportunity for them. So um, you can see a little bit more. of um, They have to learn computational practices. You can see they test, they debug. They have to, um, they went through several iterations. Um, we first had them create their design, test it, and then they had to rebuild it and then go through that again. So they we kind of reinforced the iterative process. And um, I think that there might be a couple more slides, but uh, you, that can give you the sense of, I mean, you've got 80 kids in one room, and uh, yeah. they're working with the, <laughs> And it was, <laughs> and this one's a video, I'm not sure um, if you can see it, but it kind of uh, shows the uh, extent of, uh, you know, kind of what one of their contraptions looks like when it's uh, actually working. Um, and when they're yeah, testing. I'll come back to that. Yeah, because it actually, I PDF'd it, so. Was there, more oh, okay. than, was there more than one video? Uh, there's a couple, but don't worry about it. It's fine. Okay. Um, I think the uh, the idea was uh, it was a, a first time we ever did a game jam, especially with students from other schools within the class day. Um, we actually had them excused. We had them bused to South Fayette, and uh, it took part from um, like uh, 10 in the morning until. Uh, two in the afternoon when we needed to get them back on their buses to get home. So uh, it's something we definitely want to do again and include other partner schools. So Eileen, can we delve into that a little bit further? You talked about a bunch of different sort of characteristics of game jams, things about like being open-ended and it sounds like you provided some structure but allowed for a lot of flexibility. Seems like there might have even been more flexibility in the global game jam example that Gary gave. Um, so what about this notion of sort of characteristics or elements of game jams? Like if you were to describe them, uh, what are the important principles that you would employ in trying to put on an event like this? Um, definitely they have a problem to solve. Uh, the problem may be pretty open-ended, but they are responsible for solving that problem at the end. Um, the idea that we divide them into um, responsibilities. So a team consists of certain responsibilities uh, and that helps uh, it helps them have, it empowers them to actually take a step forward and not let somebody else solve for them. They are the material specialist so they have a unique responsibility to take care of that aspect. They're a programmer so they've got to delve in and they've got to figure those pieces of it out. So I like um, delineating um, the responsibilities I think, um, again, that you mentioned, it's open-ended. Uh, it's Their imagination is really, really um, you know, what's being tested here. Like, open your mind, uh, do whatever uh, you want for this creative outcome. And that seems to be the thing they love the most. Uh, and then, uh, at the end, I guess, really the celebration. Uh, one of the things some of the uh, surveys said was that they uh, they liked seeing everybody else's work at the end. They we, we had them come together and we we walked from uh, machine to machine and they all celebrated when somebody's machine worked. And again, as as I think back to open ended, we had tools there that they had to imagine how to use. Like we had little jeeps, little cars with remote controls that um, sometimes they would use at the end, so that the marble would drop in and then they would drive it to the next table or some of them would incorporate it into the scheme so that the little car raced through and dropped the marble off somewhere else. So, um, you know, they really had, uh, you know, 
really not a lot of constraints. Anyone else want to want to chip in on that question? Gary, what was the celebration like at the Global Game Jam? Or how did, how did it conclude? Uh, well, it was actually uh, pretty interesting, a, a surprise for me. So it was at near the end of uh, the afternoon on Sunday. Everyone showed up on the in the big floor that they kicked it off, and they set up tables and computers and were showcasing their games. Uh, I was expecting there to be a whole lot more gameplay. Um, you know, really people going around and, and playing each other's games. But everyone was so excited about the thing that they made and they were sort of there to talk to people about it that um, while it was sort of crowded and it was hustling and bustling, I only got to, to sample maybe a third of the games that were out there. So that was kind of disappointing. But they, you know, they're all shared on the Internet, and so you can find them again um, at the Global Game Jam website. So you know, not all is lost. But it was just a, a very intense, fun a uh, couple of hours where you could really see all the creative ideas. And it was neat because you all were given the same prompt at the beginning, but after that, it's really up to you. You saw some beautiful artwork, some very interesting uh, new gameplay mechanics. People were trying, uh, you know, they're, they'd try new things, they weren't afraid to fail, and uh, some of the things that came out of it were just really neat to see. One of ours um, this past summer, the, the, in the summer enrichment, uh, how ours concluded was really uh, we had a rubric. Our ETC students helped us create a rubric. Um, the kids played each other's games. The parents actually came in and played uh, their games, and then we rate we ranked them uh, using the rubric. And then the following day, we had a celebration of um, you know which one was the most creative and so forth. One um, one software that we used was GameStar Mechanic. It's a free program, and again, I think we use this for second, third, and fourth graders um, using creating a game, a digital game last summer um, using GameStar Mechanic. And then again, the kids played each other's games, um, and then the parents were able to play also. So um, that was a simple piece of software that you know you really can get first, second, third graders uh, making digital games. So what about, um, do you all have advice for somebody who's looking to maybe plan a game jam? Like what what would you say are sort of the top maybe two things for somebody who wants to, to plan an event? What would you tell them to think about? I think the first thing is uh, ahead of time having students with the proper skills before they enter the game jam. Yeah. You kind of have to know uh, how to utilize uh, the materials and mm -hmm. have a sense of that. So there's a lot of pre kind of work that has to be done ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Todd, what were your lessons learned from planning your event? Well, you know, that's why I asked um, uh, Gary about, I knew that um, hit the Global Jam at the ETC had workshops beforehand and, and uh, that was the biggest thing from our, our teachers point of view when they were helping with our, our jam was you know do the kids have the the ability to do this when they when they enter um, you know think about physical uh, games you know board games to digital games um, that, that was the big question one thing I recommend is starting small I mean even getting 20 or 30 kids and trying this um, before you, you you know you invite your whole school or you know 100 kids or 300 kids I think starting small and and um, you know, just like um, Eileen said at, at, at um, South Fed, I love giving the kids the creativity and, and letting them run. You know, giving them some pri you know some barriers to some degree um, of what the project should be, or these this is the frame, but letting them be creative and and you know letting the teachers making sure the teachers don't get in the way, make sure that they're facilitators and just give some advice, but uh, let the kids run with it. Let, it. let it be their time if it's a couple hours or the weekend or the day. Um, but I, I go back to, Nikki, you've heard me say this before, I think that we don't do enough of these kind of things in schools. You know, it's almost like a culminating activity after you get done with a course uh, or halfway through the course. You're learning these skills and now let's go apply these skills what you're learning, if it's from scratch, if it's Unity, if it's whatever it is, um, how do we apply it and let pe kids be creative and innovate? Uh, we don't do, you know, I think we do a terrible job in education um, <laughs> yeah. regarding that. Yeah. Because a kid gets the grade on the report card, they move on. They never have uh, 
they never have that chance to use their skills to make or design something. And what Todd said is so important about starting small, because uh, it's it's almost like you have to. We always use these little incubator projects before we break out to to know where we were successful and where our challenges are. And now that we've run Game Jam for the first time, now the entire fifth grade. Uh, will be able to take it on as part of their STEAM learning because it's tried, it's tested, and we still have people, you know, young students now who can be leaders in each of the classrooms to kind of help negotiate. So Todd's right, small incubated projects starting off um, really contribute to success. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you think about what kids learn in, in a situation like that. I know it's not your typical learning where the desks are in the rows and, and the teacher's up there, you know, teaching. But I, I, I really believe kids learn more that way because they're applying some of their knowledge they, they know of what they've learned and actually do hands-on and, and collaboration with other kids. And you know, you think about Gary and how his kids had to communicate with everybody in his family to be able to create that game. I mean, um, those are authentic learning experiences that, that, again, don't happen enough in schools. And you know, as Todd mentioned also with students, if you talk about teachers, our teacher from Max, uh, she was so uh, a little nervous coming into this because her students had never worked with any other students outside of their building, let alone within their building, because um, their fifth grade is one classroom and they hadn't done team building before. And when she left, she said it was her best moment in education at this point ever because. Powerful. Oh, it was beautiful to see her children. And in every picture she shows up, she's laughing and smiling and so excited. But basically, she said that she didn't, her t kids were untested in terms of their ability to collaborate and that she saw them. And it actually, it was really cute. They were exchanging phone numbers with the other kids from other schools saying, you know, we want to stay with you. We want to keep talking to you. And they were exchanging. And it was a, it was a great experience that way. But for a teacher, who hasn't experienced this kind of collaboration before? It's really a great opportunity, I think, as partners to do it together. Yeah. You know, and I, and I think you know, listen to Eileen's. That's the first time I heard about her jam. Um, you think about the kids thinking that, like a material engineer. Most people don't even know what a material engineer does, and and what they were doing in that group, those kids that were the material engineers. That's what they really do in real life, and and. I think giving those kids experiences uh, can open their, their world up to different careers. And I, I think it, I, it was just awesome. I, I want to replicate it tomorrow at our school. <laughs> with you. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd love to. So it seems like uh, there's a, a huge peer-to-peer -peer element, at least in the school settings, right? Like that seems to be one way to summarize some of what you've said, is the ability for kids uh, within the same school and in different school districts to have the chance to learn from one another and explore problems together. I mean, Gary, even you, you saw that probably at some level even with your your kids. Um, but the peer-to-peer -peer learning seems to be a huge piece of, of what a game jam can do is put people in an environment where that's really welcomed and is probably expected at some level. It's also bringing peers together of different ages. We had fifth graders working with eighth graders, and that kind of vertical alignment was uh, tremendous, I think. And thus, Dustin, if you think about learning, most people, again, think of that classroom teacher and, and you know giving all that information out to kids, and why can't learning be where um, very informal, where kids are teaching other kids different concepts or different digital tools. I mean, that's still learning. But again, in education, we don't, we don't normally think that way. And we, we need to. You know, you had talked about this idea about posing a problem and that being one of the um, driving forces behind organizing a game jam. I can see I can see a lot of different groups getting into this kind of an idea where, for instance, if I am a a company and there's some problem I am trying to solve, maybe it's product related, how to get more people to sign on to my website or how to 
you know, figure out if people like a new feature of something or, you know, whatever kind of a problem. And I'm t coming at it from sort of a company or a corporate standpoint, but I could see sort of posing a couple, you know, or a problem like that and sort of turning some people loose on it and solving it in a different way than just coming up with solutions like representing it by using a game or playing, a, you know, figuring out how you can play a game to solve the problem. I mean, I'm just sort of sit, sitting here in my own mind thinking of some kind of creative ways to use the idea behind a game jam. Um, this is Susan. That was something that kind of struck me. As I heard Eileen's example, her game jam was about applying what the kids knew for Steam and game was the tool. It was the instructional strategy. Right. Whereas with the global game jam, the purpose was to create games. And so that's a little different. It, it, it's like the context is different. <clears throat> they might still be situations where you're creating and modifying games and working collaboratively. Mm -hmm. But when you think about it, it, bringing groups of kids together, I think you have to be clear on whether the game is your instructional strategy or is the game the whole thing? That's a great point. Yeah. Well, and Todd, I almost it almost sounds to me like you're thinking about using this also as kind of an instructional strategy during the school day, right? I mean, I, I I'm kind of interpolating a little bit, but I'm sort of thinking I could picture what you're describing as being something like you know a social studies teacher working on a you know, an American history unit on slavery and maybe using, creating a game jam around maybe that theme or something where then creating a game becomes the instructional strategy. Is that something that you're kind of thinking about? Uh, well, initially, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that's our long term, um, you know, trying to, you know, gamification in, in that classroom. Uh, right now, you know, with our media center, kids are going down to the media center learning uh, the, the sound equipment from our sound studio to our TV studio and actually doing projects. Um, the teachers are not the experts. You know, they're, they, some of the teachers have no idea how to use the TV studio and there's kids in there teaching our kids, the other kids, how to use that equipment. So I think it's starting that process of, you know, learning doesn't have to take place in that classroom and a very formal learning. It, it can happen in informal places. And, you know, we've learned a lot from the Sprout Fund and, and all the informal places in the Pittsburgh region from the make shop to um, to all over the, across the uh, 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 Pittsburgh region about informal learning spaces and I think education you know we need to think about that so exa you're exactly right I mean if we're working on a social studies unit you know how can we bring the kids in for two hours in our media center or three hours and they would have to research that unit and then you know create a game and and you know it's as silly as our, um, I have a fourth grade teacher um, that does, uh, the kids t pick a state, and the state, um, they have to create a game around the, the state, and, and I often tell the story, my daughter learned the 50 states by doing 50 crossword puzzles and, and 50 word searches, and this, this teacher has the kids create a game, they have to market the, the game, they have to create a box about their state, they have to create directions on if another kid plays their game, how, how to play that game. They have mm -hmm. to incorporate, you know, the, the state flag, the, you know, all those things into the game. And uh, the kids are so engaged, and they, and they don't want to stop playing each other's games. And um, that's a silly example, but, you know, how can we produce that in all of our other grade levels and at the high school level especially? Mm -hmm. I love that. And, you know, um, the Sprout Fund, I believe, last year funded um, Winchester Thurston and the Science Center to do... Uh, app Jam, and that was our first kind of, uh, we were so grateful to be invited to that. Uh, app Jam was amazing. It was, uh, first students were brought to Carnegie Science Center, and they each were given an area that they had to think, what would an app look like for this? What would it include? How you know, would this work? And then they divided into teams, and they used wire uh, screens, and then they had to design what the front page of their app looked like. When you clicked on it, what would it do? So they weren't really even at that point um, programming at all. They were simply drawing their schematics, and then at the end they presented each team presented the app that they would create for that event. So I can see that happening within schools, just in your own school, picking a problem um, or a, a group or an area that you want to focus on, and 
and then create uh, screen uh, wireframes for, um, you know, kind of the app creations, which also works as, you know, a game in a way. So, right. You know, the the other thing, Nikki. I mean, would it be a great example? Is have have your second grade or third grade give them some content area and let them use Minecraft. <laughs> I mean, you would have such cool projects. Um, you know, uh, using Minecraft. We have a lot of teachers that let kids create projects, physics projects, language arts projects in Minecraft. And mm -hmm. um, most teachers don't know what Minecraft, you know, what it is. And you ask a, a first grader, or grader, or second grader, or kindergarten kid what a what Minecraft is, they'll they'll ramble things off on you. So. So and then Gary, with the global game jam, if so, that was a little different in terms of that being the purpose was making games. It's, it is a, has a little different feel to the purpose of that event. Uh, or do you think of. it was? I mean, yes, they they wanted to have a game done. I mean, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't a game for anything. Right, and okay. I really appreciated their structure in terms of the uh, the timing of it. Right, they put it on a weekend, so it would be a fun, intense weekend. But at the end of it, you'd go back to school or you'd go back to work, and life would continue. Right, it wasn't. There was never this expectation that this game had to work. It had to go towards something else. If it failed, there'd be a consequence. They encourage you to fail, uh, and not to be afraid of failure. Um, so even though the it was still through game making, and they wanted to have a game to showcase because everyone wanted to, you know, be able to thump on their own chest a bit at the end. Uh, there was still learning and experimentation and um, trying new things out, learning about each other, learning about yourself. That was all the number one goal of it, even at the professional level. Yeah, because I think what you just said, something you, you just said was really interesting about the condensed time frame of it because I think this is one of the reasons why... Zulama and I'm interested in game jams is because in our program kids take a, like a whole semester to learn about something and along the way they make games but this idea of dedicating a, a specific time frame whether that's six hours whether it's 24 hours you know to c accomplishing something you know concrete definitely I mean I think to me that's part of the idea of a game jam where it, it seems like that means it's a it's a, there's a beginning, middle, and an end in 48 hours or less, something like that. Like, it doesn't go on for more than three days, because then it's not a game jam anymore. Then it's a game development process or something like right. that. No, no, games can take a long time to make. When I make right. games, I can get 80% of the way done, and then that last 20% will take just as long as the first 80%. Just that polishing it up and getting it ready to ship out the door, right? Yeah. That, that part can be tedious, and it's not all that creative. It's just about buttoning it up and getting it ready, you know. With, but with a game jam, you can cover a lot of ground. You can make an 80% game, and that's where the learning happens. That's where the creativity is, and you don't have to worry about the baggage associated with, you know, making sure all the, the loose ends are tied up. You can go straight to the fun, straight to the creativity, and straight to the learning. Mm -hmm. So that's what's interesting, right? Because, Gary, your, your game may ultimately make it to the App Store, but I would bet many of those other games sort of die on the vine, for lack of a better phrase, and that's perfectly okay. Like, um, it's very much about that experience and not adding to the App Store tally. Um, and that's sort of an important thing here. It's like, it, game jams are, are time-boxed for a reason. Like, they're a galvanizing activity, um, and then you could sort of, like you said, maybe go back to whatever else you were doing. But in some ways, like, the game jamming you did when you were a kid, Gary, has propelled you on to many other sort of gaming-related things for decades. Right, and, and you said they may die on the vine, but the analogy I like to use is a compost heap. You know, you, there you, throw, your, there you, you go. throw your trash in there, and it'll <laughs> biodegrade, but then it'll give life to something new. Yeah. And so with the global game jam, all of the games, for uh, all the code, everything is open source. It's, it's uploaded, so you can go and you can find it. So while uh, a game developer may not ever go revisit their game, maybe someone saw that and said, oh, that's cool. I want to use that. And maybe they'll actually use their source code, or maybe they'll just inspire something down the line. And that's one of the really cool things. Um, you, know, you, you have this extra uh, multi-generational sort of impact of the game jams because it inspires creativity. Yeah, that's a success great. story. 
So what about learning outcomes? I know, um, Eileen, you were talking about computational thinking. We talked a lot about soft skills like collaboration. Is there anything else when you think about doing this in school versus outside of school? Does it, does it really matter where we do game jams? Is it all going to have the same, um, you know, effect? Or do you think that there are certain things we can do to achieve certain learning outcomes? I think if ahead of time you identify what those outcomes are, it can be done anywhere, uh, and you know it's uh, it's really open to uh, to that opportunity. Um, yeah, again, for us, uh, we because they were studying because we were trying to reinforce you know computational practice, computational thinking, and habits of mind. That was all part of the before they got to game jam. That was part of their lessons, mm -hmm. and then when they came to game jam, we could say to them, "Oh, how did you?" use what you learned in your class when you actually attended Game Jam. And so they all, you know, kind of understood that every one of those concepts, that the collaboration, the not giving up, you know, no matter how often they fail, you know, that all entered into um, being successful. I'll also jump in and say that one of the, the neat educational outcomes for me and my family was a connection to the real world and it was neat to see that that can take place among a, a seven-year-old and a five-year-old right so so my kids knew how to color with markers and they knew how to paint but this was the first time that coloring with markers and painting mattered for some sort of external reason right because we had a deadline we had till Sunday afternoon to get this done daddy needs to take a picture with the camera so he can put it into the game you need to finish that snake you know <laughs> and, and and the first couple drawings were fun, but after maybe an hour or two, you know, that was rough on the kids. And so they had to, <laughs> uh, they, they really experienced the whole work play interplay saying, you know what, some of the things that I do for fun can be, uh, you know, there's, people do it for a living. And uh, sometimes this work can be fun. You know, it's something that they, they exposed, uh, got exposure to for the first time there. Yeah, that's a really good point. I really like that idea because I think um, we come up against that a lot with our game development courses where students get into, especially with games programming, they get into the course and they have some immediate successes in terms of learning how to program. And then, you know, then of course there's always that lesson or two where it gets a little tougher, you know, and they, got, they have to stick with it and they have to figure it out. And we might even have put something in the course where there is a little bit of a mistake. And so intentionally, we sort of force them to have to figure it out. And that's a really tough, very difficult concept for a lot of kids to, to get their head around is how when you're faced with adversity, how you do you just sit and put your hand up and get your teacher to come over and help you get out of it? You know, or do you roll your sleeves up and figure it out yourself or you know, you and your partner figure it out together? We're definitely tackling that. And I think that's actually one of the reasons why we're kind of interested in this idea about game jams and exploring them more and as as like Todd, you kind of mentioned, you know, that maybe it doesn't have to be a, only thinking about it as a culminating event, that, it, that you can use that game jam concept or that practice of a game jam more often than maybe just sort of at the end of something, that it could be part of a process maybe. And I think the kids will see the relevance of what they're learning, you know, that I can, I, what I'm learning I can go and apply and, and do something or make something with. Uh, I totally agree with that. Yeah. What about pitfalls? What about um, mistakes? Like Eileen, did there, is there something that didn't work that you really did have to learn from for next time, or Todd, or I know Gary, you weren't the organizer of the event, but <laughs> what kind of pitfalls did you encounter? Yeah, I think we were really, really afraid of. Uh, we we were really afraid to go into it because we didn't know what to expect. So. Um, I mean, part of that I can see would keep people from actually doing it because we as teachers didn't know how this was going to turn out. Right. Um, for us, um, what we have to do better probably is uh, timing, keeping people on time, you know, making sure we hit um, first iteration, okay, ready for your second, you know, managing 80 kids at one time. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll work better on next time. But, um, yeah, and yeah. I think the, the one part that they want more of is to connect afterwards. They made friends. 
and I haven't found a way yet to make that happen, which I need to do, but to continue the experience, to, to give them something more to build for, that mm -hmm. would be my hope. Awesome. And, and for us at Elizabeth Ford, I think when we did it during the day at our high school, uh, I felt bad for our computer programmers because we only had a handful of programmers and we had a lot of artists, a lot of designers, um, and a lot of creative, you know, storytellers. But, um, I, you know, we struggled with enough programmers out there to actually make something out of, you know, digitally. Um, so I, I think that, again, making sure your kids, know, you know, what your kids can do using what programs, um, do you have enough kids to be able to actually produce some things. So, um, the one in the uh, summertime worked out really well with the, with the little kids and using GameStar Mechanic and, and getting the parents involved. Um, that was just awesome. And again, but that was after two weeks of learning GameStar Mechanic that they were able to, um, uh, you know, create their own game um, and let, let other kids and, and parents play test. So, but I think at the high school level, when you're starting to make digital games out of, you know, basically nothing and using Game Maker or Game Salad or Unity, I, you know, you really got to know what your kids can uh, kids can create. Yeah, that's those are definitely good points. And you know, it's mm -hmm. unfortunate what you say about there not being enough programmers, not enough developers, is what uh, you know p business people say all the time. <laughs> they say, you know, that that th completely mirrors what we're finding in the workforce. We need more people that have those technical skills. Just you know, they need to be able to work on teams, but we we could re definitely use some more programmers. Yeah. Gary, what about with you with a global game, game jam? Have you connected with anybody um, since the event? Uh, so, just the fact that I brought my kids sort of, uh, you know, started a lot of interesting conversations with people. So, yeah. um, you know, the, it had those conversations. Uh, I haven't really had a, a, a strong, tangible connection come out with other game developers from that, um, and I think that's pretty typical. It, it, it's okay, you know, it's, it's that weekend that you sort of uh, walk away from at the end, um, and it was the learning experience sort of self-contained. So, so nothing super tangible has, has come out. Um, I mean, I, I hope that when the app hits the App Store and uh, other families across the country start using it, they'll say, hey, I want to do something like this with my kids. And, they, and they'll see that the art, it's clearly painted by a little kid, and they'll realize that eh, I, I can do that. And then, no, I use my programming skills, but you don't need to be a programmer to make games with your kids. Right. You know, and, and kids love games and play, and, and sort of giving your own family a little game-based challenge to make a game around can be something anyone can do. That's awesome. Cool. Well, we're we're coming up we're coming up on the hour, and uh, we started with Gary's story, and, and maybe we can end there. And there <laughs> um, but uh, my thanks to all of you for being part of this conversation today. Eileen, thank you for being here, and uh, Susan and Todd, uh, as well as Nikki and Gary and and Gary's family. I felt like they were here. With us today. <laughs> um, so uh, this uh, this series of hangouts will continue. Uh, and uh, the next, the next one I'd like to invite you to is actually on May 27th, uh, two o'clock Eastern. And uh, from game jams to talking about ways to sort of modernize information technology in schools. So that's going to be our next topic. Um, but thanks to everybody for being here uh, and everybody for watching. And we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks all.